This is Gardening with William DeMille. This is our Thursday night question and answer where I help you have the very best garden of your entire life. We discuss gardening, farming, livestock, the Georgic tradition, soil health, education. The purpose of this whole thing is to increase your health from the ground up, helping you get nutrients from the most nutrient-dense soils by creating nutrient-dense foods which give us health and vitality. I'm going to share my screen, and we are going to get started tonight. It's pretty exciting to be uh, sharing this stuff with you. It is gardening season right now. Gardening season is the busy, busy time of year, and we are right in the middle of it right now so we're the middle of may which is the middle of april for me because i'm a month behind most gardeners because of my climate because i'm at 5800 feet a cold climate lots of snow lots of snow melt cold winters and an 80 day growing season on a lucky year sometimes our last frost is june 15th sometimes our first frost in the fall is august 24th and that makes it very hard to grow here. The old timers in our area tell me that they have seen frosts every single month of the year here. And so they laughed at me when I said I was coming here to garden. But I actually came here to build an elaborate solar greenhouse that is dug into the ground, Wallapini style. And that is where we grow the majority of our food. And our Wallapini is growing enough food to feed uh, 15 to 20 people, 80% of our food supply, which is pretty fantastically wonderful. And we hit that goal last year. The first year, we didn't quite hit that. And I think this year, we are going to be able to um, hit that again. This spring has been fantastic because we've had so much irrigation water. It has been the greatest thing in the world. And we're going to get into our Q&A now. I had a, a question this week about soil tests. So uh, a man, a local guy brought some soil to me, he wanted me to test it. So I ran his tests and I sent them to him um, this morning, actually. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about soil tests. The way I do a soil test is a new method. It's new methodology in the world today, and it's been developed in recent years over the course of uh, significant research over the past 40 years, but the way we do the test is, is much newer than that. In the last uh, decade, it's just been developed. So it's on the cutting edge, the razor sharpness of science, which is so exciting to me. The old tests would test for nutrients in the soil that plants can use. And that is the most common test that's out there. And the test, there's different ways of doing the older tests, but they're still the most common. If you have your local uh, like university extension, um, send off soil tests or you know labs that have been around for a long time, this is what they're doing. These tests were developed in the 19... Uh, 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, and they're they're fine, they're good. They tell you one set of things, but they don't tell you the latest science, which is more useful. Once the older tests are done, they will tell you a recommendation of a fertilizer to put into the soil. So here's what you need to grow plants. And that's what most people expect from a soil test because that's how it's been most of our lives. But with the new tests, the way that I do it, it uh, it tests for the organisms that are in the soil, that are active, that are alive, that are breaking down the sands, silts, and clays into plant available nutrients so without the organism you need fertilizers with the active living organisms in the soil most of them are microscopic then you don't need to add fertilizer to the soil 
And if you think about the most productive soils in the world, which would be old growth forests, think of the redwoods in Northern California, those areas produce more energy per acre, and we, we can uh, measure that in calories. So more calories per acre than any farming that humans can do. So when we create a fantastic, beautiful soil, it's, uh, it's because we introduce or inoculate the beneficial organisms into our soils. And so we don't so we do that once, uh, maybe a, a series of three or four inoculations would be one time getting it in there. So so it's a series of doing it, but it's one action, it's one plan. We're gonna do this over the period of, of one growing season. And there's a good chance that after you do that, you never have to add fertilizer again. And so this is a new way of thinking in the agricultural world. But it's better. It's better because it becomes more profitable for the farmer. And that is a good thing. It makes the soils healthier, which makes the plants healthier. And we know the plants are healthier because there's been many tests done worldwide of people taking plants, sending them to labs, and having the plant tissues tested for nutrients. And the nutrients are higher, and they're uh, digestible. They're, they taste better. They look better. They're bigger. They're stronger. They have pest resistance and disease resistance. So these are all many of the benefits of what we call uh, the secondary metabolites being turned on in the plants. So after I run a test like this in the soil and figure out which organisms you are missing, then what I do, instead of recommending fertilizer, I recommend what organisms you need in your soil. So most soil samples that I look at have a lot of bacteria, uh, which is good because the bacteria is the foundation for all of the other life forms that come later. So uh, fungus is usually not present in very high quantities in soil samples. Um, and you know the fungus is really important you need to have the fungus because it is a very important mineralizer to turn those sand silts and clays into the trace elements that your plants need they also help with the nitrogen cycle um and uh, bacteria do the same thing bacteria become the food source for the protozoa group so those would be things like amoebas and ciliates and uh fl flagellates so these uh, creatures in the protozoa group, they eat up to 10,000 bacteria a day. And when they eat them, they release nitrogen. So, so by having the protozoa and the beneficial nematodes and microarthropods and earthworms and incotraeids, all of these good creatures in the soil will drive both the mineral cycle and your nitrogen cycle. No, the nitrogen cycle is part of the mineral cycle, but I mention nitrogen because it's one of the elements that um, is lost the quickest from the soil. So that's a little bit about soil tests. Now, let me uh, see if I can escape this, and I'm going to show you a different document here. So here's a soil test. This one was called sample number one or dad's garden. And this is a soil sample I ran yesterday. And so we were looking for the functional groups. So if you look at the chart, I'll come up to number one through five in a minute. But let's just look at these groups. I'm going to make this bigger so we can focus on it here. Hopefully you can see that. If you can't, somebody better tell me. But the functional groups. Uh, so in the microscope, we are looking for living, active bacteria that is doing its thing it is eating it is mineralizing it is reproducing it's respirating it's doing the things uh, that it does in life and the bacteria come in different shapes and sizes and in this soil sample they were in sufficient populations in fact they were so high that they need predators to eat them there were way too many bacteria 
to have healthy garden crops. But what you would have in this soil is a massive amount of weeds sprouting. So when your bacteria is very high, your weeds sprout like crazy because the bacteria give off a form of nitrogen called nitrate. And nitrate will wake up and sprout many of the annual weed species that gardeners tend to not like very well. So what do we need to do to amend this? We need to amend the soil, even though yes, they're in sufficient populations, what that means is yeah, they're driving the nitrogen cycle and they are sufficient to feed protozoa, nematodes, and all the other predators that are gonna eat them. So, we need to be adding compost and get living roots in the soil. And depending on the plant you're going to grow, it would depend on the type of detritus sphere you're going to build on top of the ground. Now, just to remind you, the detritus is the trash on top of the ground, so dead, dying plant material. So if you want late succession plants like strawberries and tomatoes, you would be putting in, they're not actually a late succession, but they're later than some of your other garden crops. So within context of talking about garden crops, they are in on the late side of middle succession. So you would want to be putting more wood chip type material on that soil because the wood chips is what the fungus eat. So we need to be building up fungal populations. Uh, I, I saw some fungus. So on the notes to the right, I put in low populations. Uh, in the functional group of protozoa, there were none detected. Nematodes, none detected. Microarthropods and actinobacteria, none were detected. And a really awesome thing is I'd never saw any disease-causing organisms at all. There were no detrimental fungi, and there was no detrimental bacteria. And there were no detrimental protozoa. So this soil was oxygenated, or you would see a high uh, volume of ciliates, and I did not see that. So this was a pretty good soil. So what can you do with this soil? So th that's what I put up here. Let's see. Maybe I didn't put it there. Let me go down here. Well, it's at the very bottom, and I'm not going to go through all these today. But right here, I just put in here, um, the samples were good. There was a little bit of fungi, but in very low populations. So this soil falls in an early successional state, meaning that weeds will be prevalent due to the lack of predators eating bacteria. And the lack, this doesn't say this, but and the lack of uh fungus we need to get the fungus up there to be creating more ammonium which is a form of nitrate that we or i mean nitrogen that we need in there but the great thing is this sentence right here these soils would grow brassicas without too much effort so that is pretty great so you could go into this garden soil and get a whole bunch of kale collards turnips those things would grow pretty good in this soil the way it is. So that's fantastic to get the garden going. But if we want something like sweet corn or wheat or oats or barley, we need to get more fungus in the soil. So that's just a little bit about, about root crops. Let me go back to my to my presentation here. Did I say root crops? I'm I'm insane. A little bit about some of what I was thinking and the reason I said that, because I know it sounded out of context. What was happening in my head is it's a little bit about the crops that could grow in that soil. But I said it in a strange way that maybe sounded like we were talking about the entire rest of the soil sample discussion. But let's open this up for questions. Right before we do that, I just have my slide up here to show you some of the awesome things. Summer boot camp is August 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Get that on your calendar. That will be focusing on getting your fall gardens ready so that you have enough food to get you through winter and springtime. 
Winter's usually not too bad to eat, but springtime is starvation season. Let's not get hungry and starve. You know, if we were 200 years ago, what I just said makes sense. If you're in North Korea, what I just said makes sense. In the United States, we are so blessed with an abundant food supply that maybe it was a little bit irrelevant what I said. Okay. Our 17-week course is starting. Uh, uh, my students show up in two days. And it starts Monday morning. So that is fantastic. We have a waiting list already started for next year, for 2024. So if you want to learn to be a farmer and be able to make money farming because you are not spending all of your profits on fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, lots of diesel fuel, and gigantic tractors, then come to this boot camp and you will learn how to be able to understand soil health and to put that into practice. So that is pretty exciting. My book is done and it is ready to order off of Amazon. If you have not yet got my book, Worry-Free Eating, here's a picture of it right here. Jump on Amazon and get it. If you go to my website, www.georgic, I don't even know what my website's called. Georgicrevolution.com. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm so dumb when it comes to computer stuff. I better write a script. www.georgicrevolution.com. And, uh, you can order my book from there, and you can sign up for my newsletter. So those are important things to be able to do. So thank you for being on here. Let's open this up for Q&A, and go ahead and ask your questions tonight. So I have a question. Um, I've been looking into some different kinds of greenhouses, uh, we, we kind of want to extend our growing season out here a little bit. We we have 70 dependable days on a good year. We might get as many as 80 this year. We might get 90. It's a pretty good year. But I'd like to be able to consistently get a good tomato harvest and such. And so I want to put together a, a greenhouse. Um, I'm on a budget. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I'd, I'd just get a bunch of steel beams and weld it together. Um, so what I was thinking of doing, um, based on a bunch of stuff is getting some two inch steel pipe pounded it into the ground, then getting some, some half inch PVC pipe and just kind of running it in big arcs about nine feet wide, nine feet tall and about 20 feet long, then just covering it in greenhouse plastic from Amazon. And all in all, that should be under a thousand dollars. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have any advice or thoughts or if you think there's ways i could change that plan to do it a little better no that will work it's certainly temporary if you get big winds it'll blow it away uh the pvc pipes will be crushed in a snowstorm uh you need to put them probably two feet apart your bows to be really strong for the wind i've seen greenhouses like that before last pretty good for four or five years so on a budget, it's fine. I would make it low profile. The top on the inside probably don't go over seven feet. Like six and a half feet um, is probably better. Because if it's high profile, the wind hurts it. Um, if you're inside a yard with solid fences and houses around, that's good because it will protect it from the wind. Uh, the way that you fasten the, the greenhouse plastic on is really important. And you, I recommend that you use uh, the polylock channel. You can get that from places like uh, Farmer's Friend or um, Greenhouse Megastore or uh, what's that other one? Um, anyway, there's a bunch of places. You, you just get, in fact, Amazon has it. You can just say you channel the greenhouse plastic fastening. And then so you have the U-channel and then the wiggle wire that goes inside of it to hold it on. 
Um, you can use one by twos and a good screw gun, but if you do that, put your uh, screws in every six inches and suck them up good like a vise because the screws are not what's holding your plastic. It's the two pieces of boards put together tight like a vise is what will hold it. Um, yeah, so those are thoughts on greenhouses. Um, yeah. There you go. Did that help? Yes, it did. Uh, Follow-up question. Um, with talking about what we talked about tonight with the microbiology, will keeping the soil warmer longer in the year help the microbiology, or does it need cold periods to, like, I don't know, go dormant or something to actually be healthy? Are, are there microbiological implications to using greenhouses long term? Yeah, so you can use them year round and so that it doesn't really, the ground never freezes. That's totally fine. Uh, don't worry about your microbiology. It'll take care of itself as far as temperature goes. The warm season ones, they just go dormant when cool weather gets here. And then they will either turn into spores or cysts. We call that sporulating or cyst cystating. And then they will, uh, they'll just be dormant until the temperatures get warm again in the springtime. And then they become active again. So it, you're not really going to kill them. You do want to keep your living root in the soil as much as possible and keep the soil covered with a mulch. If you're covering it with a greenhouse, you're just going to keep those uh, those certain species that stay alive at warmer temperatures. They'll just stay alive longer, which is fantastic. So yeah, you don't you never have to rest the the soil. As far as microbiology goes, that's not anything to worry about. Okay, cool. So if I, so the, the greenhouse, uh, it's only going to have the one layer of plastic. So it's not really going to be insulated exactly. Um, is there, is there a way to like actually insulate a greenhouse? I've seen, I've seen, uh, like I think we did this on a greenhouse years and years ago where we, we put a blower in between two layers of plastic and pumped it full of air. So it was like bubbled out. Um, is that actually a good method of creating a, like an insulation barrier? So it's going like, to give you an R factor, excuse me. It's going to give you an R factor of one to, to have that, uh, that double wall that's filled with air. So that's, and there's other people who have said that the insulation factor is better than that. I don't, I don't really know. And I don't even know how to test the R factor, but that's what the greenhouse industry said for years, you know, decades. And then it's just been in recent videos in the last few years that I've seen people saying it has an R value of four or five or seven or something. So I don't know. Um, but no, the, the insulation factor is not why you do that. The reason that you have two pieces of plastic and you fill it with static air that keeps inflated with a fan that's running is to give you wind protection so that when the wind beats against your plastic, it doesn't beat it up and tear it off. So because if a, if a greenhouse, if you can keep it full of air, you're good. But if it runs out of air and then your plastic is flapping, it's that flapping motion up and down that's going to create a real problem with the, because the wind will rip it if it's flapping around. So there's that. Okay. So I have a, a question here. Somebody sent me and they said, what kind of fertilizer should I use on tomatoes? You know, and then they, and then they continued and said, I used blood meal one year and the tomatoes were very dark green and they never produced fruit. And a neighbor said I had too much nitrogen. So what do I do? Because I thought that blood meal was organic and good. Okay, here's the deal. If you use too much uh, blood meal, you certainly can get too much nitrogen in the soil. I do put some blood meal with my tomatoes, but it's just a pinch. It's the tiniest bit. So I will mix up uh, like five cups of eggshells, five cups of azomite, five cups of... Uh, bone meal and so those are three sources of calcium there's other stuff in there but three different types of calcium and then uh, 
I hate to say different types because calcium is calcium, but it's three different sources of calcium. And it seems like the microbiology acts a little bit differently with different kinds of calcium. So the plants really do great with it, with a diversity of different sources. And there's other stuff in there. Okay. So those were your three calciums. And then I put an alfalfa meal and I just make my own alfalfa. I, I just like pick alfalfa, dry it like hay, and then I put it in a blender and turn it to powder. And so the same amount of all of those. And then I put in about, so those were five cups of each of those. And then I put in a half a cup of blood meal. So that makes a pretty good fertilizer for, for the, uh, you know, pretty much anything. So when I transplant plants, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, uh, cabbages, broccoli, all kinds of things I'm putting in my garden, I'll just take a tablespoon of that mix and I put a tablespoon in the hole where I'm transplanting the plants and, and I just transplant it normal. And then I water it with some compost extract. And throughout the year, if my soil is not functioning yet, uh, then I will be adding in inoculant and you can go ahead and inoculate with compost extract while you're doing that. And then, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's a good fertilizer mix. So you have all those other things and just a little bit of, uh, of, of blood meal. It's good to have some not a nitrogen source, but yeah, if you put in way too much nitrogen, your tomatoes can take off and get really huge and big. But the biggest problem with tomatoes is not when they get too huge. Most people can't get them to grow enough. And then, and so, you know, it's good to give them those extra food sources. So that, I think that was all our questions tonight. So we are going to say thank you for participating. Thank you for listening. If you need anything, you can send me your questions. We will discuss them on our next Q&A. Next week, I will be teaching a, a seminar, a, a, a one-hour presentation for agsteward.fyi at 4 o'clock on Thursday. And then I am traveling to Salt Lake because I'm giving a speech at a homeschool conference in Salt Lake City on Friday. So I will not be available Thursday evening. So if you want to tune in, then you need to be subscribed to my newsletter. And then you can get the link for my speech next week on Thursday. Good night and have a fantastic garden.